Hey everybody, welcome to the Faith Church Podcast. I am your host, Jay Williams, and joining me today is Jeff Clossy. Hey Jay, good morning, man. Good morning. How are you doing? Really well. How are you? I'm I'm doing great because we are recording this on April 16th. And what that means is my taxes are done. I actually was wondering about that on yep. the way in this morning. If I got them done? Yeah. Here's the fun thing about me. <laughs> I am a total last minute. And when I say last minute, I'm like, I don't even look for things until April 15th. <laughs> I, I you don't, mean the forms? And- yeah. I don't even know. I'm not even sure where they oh are. Oh, gosh. And the thing is that, I mean, this time there were a couple, there were some that I knew. Like when I'm leading up to it, when I realize it's April, I, if I see something, I'll usually set it aside, but then there'll be other things where I'm just like, I don't want to think about it. I don't want to think about it. And then on April 15th, I'm like, ah, and so, uh, that's what I did. And, but here's the thing I, and I did this all through college and I'm just a last, very last minute person, but I've never, ever filed for an extension. I was going to say, you can always push that button. <laughs> I've never done that. Not one time. Last year when it was like April 18th or whatever was the day, because when April 15th falls on like a Friday or a Saturday, you know, they move it back or whatever. And when it was like April 18th one year and I waited till April 18th, but I've never filed for an extension. And the same thing happened like in college with assignments. I would like slide it under the professor's door, you know, at 1159 PM or whatever the case is. Um, but never, never asked so were for you an up extension. late last night. No, I got it done. I got I I got him to I got him done plenty of time, man. It was That's like great. it was like four in the afternoon, and I was done. <laughs> it's like, come on, man. the servers are crashing. I was last minute people, right? I know that's <laughs> I know, but you know, it's done. It's done. That's a relief. April sixteenth is always a good day, and my dad's birthday is April fifteenth. Oh, so well, happy birthday! Yeah, tax day, tax day, dad's birthday. It's great. You know, it's a great day. I know we we uh, Jay and I got to lead a really wonderful membership class on Sunday afternoon, right after service. It was just awesome. A uh, great group of people. And when, when we were leaving in the parking lot, Jay said, well, I'm off to <laughs> do taxes. Yeah. Well, that was, yeah. On Sunday. So, so I actually, funny. I actually started a little early. I did, did do a little prep work on the 14th this time. So yeah. yeah. Oh man. Yeah. And that makes, and so there are people, when I mentioned that to me, that is just so normal. Yes. And then there are other people that, that just makes them so stressed. Yeah, I, I, I'm a kind of more of the middle ground. I'm not like the first day. When did you get them done? A couple weeks ago. So I wasn't early either. Yeah, but you're one of those people I had a that... friend who said, wow, you got them done early. So there's a lot of guys yeah, in your yeah. shoes. Other yeah. people are telling me, what's wrong with you? Why don't you have them done? I'm like, well, honestly, just couldn't get them done. Had other stuff going on. You're a unique person though. I feel like there are people who get things done early because it just hangs on them and they stress out about it. And they're like, I got to get this done. I got to get it out of the way. Yeah. And there are people like me who are just like, I don't want to think about it until the last minute and then I'll do it. But you're like one of those, I have a couple of friends like this where you're able to actually block out time and you're like, okay, well, I will have time to do that on the 2nd of April. Yep. And and then you're able That's to do it. Then. And you don't worry about it until the 2nd of April and then you do it on the 2nd of April and then it's done. And I, I admire that, but it is so foreign to me. I do not know how to function in that way, I try to do that. I'll like block off time to do different things, mm-hmm. on, um, and sometimes it can work, but most of the time, it's I I don't know what's going to actually happen in that time. So something else happened exciting yesterday besides what tax day for me. I got to reach out to my new soccer team for the summer. I am so uh-huh. excited about that because it's soccer season, and uh, so this was the initial hey, welcome to the team, and here's our first practice. But it made me very excited for summer. Yeah, it is. Like, you definitely start to get the feeling. I realized because I'm going to be gone next couple of weeks. Um, well, once I'll be here on Sunday, but then I'll be gone the next Sunday. I'll be in Colorado teaching. And I realized I told Lauren, when I get back from that, we have two weeks until graduation. Wow. And that, that kind That's of wild. freaks me out a little bit. So, so for me, this, the summer, the looming summer carries like way more weight for me this year with my first, my oldest. Graduate. Oh, not your graduation. Not my graduation, no. <laughs> no, I've graduated a couple of times. I feel like I'm, I might have one more graduation left in me. Yeah, this at is some a big point, one for but, you. Um, but yeah. Because they get done early this year, right? They get done early because of the school, like yeah. the construction. So they're done early. And so, yeah, that's, it's wild. That is so, wild. But we're just one week at a time. And that's one of the reasons why I'm glad we're preaching through a book like Philippians because it just, every, 
it's it's not hard to uh, to mine things out of this letter. No, I will it, say that like, it's really not. Every text I read, I'm going like, well, that's that's pretty obvious. What we're gonna be, you know, it's not not a lot of not a lot of digging is necessary to to get the concept and the the kind of the main point and everything. It's just you know, then you have to figure out how you're gonna present it and everything. But it's interesting how we know the word of God is living, right? It's it's alive and some some areas of the Bible, it's easier, I think, to feel that. We know it's true even if we don't feel it, but mm-hmm. um, this letter in particular, it, it's just so applicable. My routine uh, the last couple of weeks has been that I listen to it, and actually it's mm-hmm. interesting because it's only four chapters long. It doesn't take very long to listen to the whole thing on like the Bible app on my phone. So this morning I was walking and listening to it, and I had that feeling that you just described over and over, like, wow, that, that, that applies, that applies. It is so easy to... Um, to make the connection to where we are now, even though we're in a very different situation than Paul was. And I'm not in prison. You're not in prison, but you can really make these connections. And you did that on Sunday. I mean, yeah. Are you, is this one of those ones, Jay, where you feel like you can give us like a, a, the two minute, here's what I said? Yeah. I mean, well, I feel like he, this one is one that in theory, uh, a better man could do it in way less time than that. But I would say, um, I just like I think verse twelve. Verse twelve is just such a powerful synopsis of what this section is about. Where Paul says, "I I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel." I mean, just that phrase right there. So I would say that was the main point: is the church in Philippi is worried. They are concerned for Paul. They are concerned for the gospel. They are concerned for themselves. They're looking around at a world around them that seems chaotic and scary, and they are unsure of what is to happen. And Paul makes it really clear that not only have these circumstances of my imprisonment and the persecution, not only has uh, have those not thwarted the gospel, they've actually served to advance the gospel. And so what does that look like in our lives? To know that God is not a victim of any of our circumstances, but that he is the master and sovereign Lord over all of our circumstances, and to know that every single one of them is meant to advance the gospel. And sometimes we can see quickly how that would be. And then other times we can't. And and then sometimes there are some circumstances that we won't know until glory, like how that served to advance the gospel. So I think if there's anything, I mean, that would be the synopsis. But then I think if if we went into the question of what would we cover if we had more time, I'd probably dig more into that idea of um, that I, I would not want this to go down a road of saying, okay, so you need to figure out what God is doing in this circumstance. So you need to figure out, um, you know, how God is using this. Because sometimes when we do that, we end up like one um, kind of being flippant about the pain that people are going through of just like, well, he's going to, he's going to use this, you know, and, and we just kind of gloss over the grief and the pain. Sometimes we then oversimplify what God is actually doing, that what he's doing is way deeper and way longer than some of the short, quick answers that we sometimes, um, and so I wouldn't, I wouldn't want that at all, but it doesn't change the reality of what's happening. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good warning. I do think it can be when you're convinced that God is in the details, that the things that are happening are not just happening, he has his sovereign hands involved, it can be a temptation to start to step back. And you know what can happen sometimes is we become spiritually weird. Like we just, we're almost like superstitious. We're, we're reading into things that um, we may or may not be called by him to read into. And yeah, so that's a good warning that th- this is not meant to, for us to then, try to exact all the time what is God doing and how does it advance the gospel? How does it fulfill his purposes? And it actually is for us to say, we know that it does. And that's the act of trust, right? It doesn't require the same level of trust to, if you knew exactly how it's going to work out. But he calls us into that, into the trusting him as our shepherd, as our father who's with us, and he is working things out according to his purposes it's interesting that even that verse you read that, that summarizes so well this section, if you inverted it, 
what a different meaning it has. If you say, if it said like, I want you to know that because I'm in prison, the advance of the gospel has come to a screeching halt. Mm. And so I need you to rise up or whatever. I need you to do yeah. something to get, get me, me out, out of here. here right. Of here, yeah. Like you just think about the different. And the reason I, you, you all have, you've listened to the podcast for a while, you know that I like to invert verses like that or make them say the opposite because sometimes my experience is the opposite and it helps me to see that it's the opposite. You know, I can feel like, and I'm sure you can relate, Jay, where it's like, I can feel like, well, this circumstance is it is inhibiting and preventing this good thing from happening. I'm convinced of it and I need to change it really badly, you know? And Paul's not saying that here for his. I just, I don't, I think it can bring out the richness of it when we do that. Well, and you also see the tension of, he's also not saying, hey, you all should go try to get arrested. Because look at, look at how the gospel advances when you're all getting arrested. There is a, and and that's what I think people, where we struggle with this, and you say, I, I think if most, if if this had happened today in the United States, you can bet that people would be trying to bust him out of jail. They'd be trying to bring bring legal action against. They'd be doing all these different things. And, um, but you could also say, well, like what? So then we just like want to, you know, have people want to get arrested? No, you. But the the key is, and what Paul is saying is, he actually doesn't know how this is going to turn out. And we'll talk about that more next week, but he doesn't know. He doesn't know if he's going to live or he doesn't know if he's going to die. He doesn't know if he'll get it released or not. He doesn't know. He's both communicating what he has seen short term, how he has seen this advance the gospel, and a confidence that God will complete this work and that he won't be put to shame because he knows he knows that God will cause him to persevere and that the gospel will be advanced. And so it's about being faithful in the moment. If if the um if they decided to like let him go free, which they do. I mean, we believe that he he was released and then went and and did more missions and then was arrested again where he was eventually put to death. Um he didn't he doesn't say like no no no, the method is to be imprisoned. And the method is like I gotta like to try to be beaten and imprisoned, and that's how the gospel advances. Like it's not that; it's that whatever circumstance God uses, which we'll get to talk about later in Philippians when he talks about I can do all things through Christ, you know, through Him who gives me strength, is that concept of look, whatever the circumstance you're in, whether you have a lot, you don't have a lot, you're sick, you're healthy, you're in prison, you're free, like whatever those circumstances serve to advance the gospel. And and so I think it's on both ends. It's really helpful when you're suffering or when you're going through a hard season to just know that is the reality and to be open to that and just to focus then, because that allows you to be focused more on being faithful to Christ in the circumstance rather than focused on trying to like manipulate or change the circumstance. But it also is important for people who are in like pleasant circumstances currently. Um, you know, to, to the church in Philippi, like there are people, obviously most of them were not in prison, right? And they weren't, they weren't being beaten. And, um, and there are people who had money and had resources. And so the question is, how do those circumstances, like those also exist to, to advance the gospel, um, both outwardly and, and inwardly. Yeah. It strikes me that it's so much of what undergirds this like in Paul, like in his example here, is just this confidence that this yep. work is God's work and he's joining God in it, not doing it on his own. Right. And and that means no matter what circumstance he is in, he can trust him in it. Like, you know, another way of putting it is, is God in heaven right now wringing his hands over the circumstance that I find myself in? Is he worried about it? Or is he strong and confident and joyful and loving in the midst of it. And in my life, asking myself that question can be really helpful. Is God wringing his hands over this right now? Or does he know what he's doing? And does he call me to trust him? And even to confess when it's really hard to trust you, God, right now, because it feels like this is happening. And and, and even a bit of a lament in the middle of this circumstance. But I mean, this whole letter is, is this, right? It's over and over again, we can trust him with every detail. We can trust him that he is at work. We can trust him that he knows what's happening and things are not out of control. And he's going to use it for his glory. And 
And that's the where I think it really hits to us in our daily lives is that we like in every moment we want to be we want to be really fixated and focused on how am I responding faithfully to Jesus in this moment not how am I addressing these circumstances and we live in a culture that not only is fixated on circumstances but that's when we talk about kind of external like stances and postures and um yeah, in these circumstances where we think, okay, this is happening in our culture, so we have to change the circumstance of our culture rather than, okay, how what does it look like to be faithful to Christ in the midst of this situation? Um, and then knowing that, trusting that that is going to actually advance the gospel. But again, like, we, like I talked about on Sunday, in order for that to actually be helpful, we have to actually desire that the true gospel is the gospel that's advanced. And too often we're exposed, like our false, our idolatrous kingdoms are exposed in the way we approach these circumstances because it it becomes very clear really quickly that, well, yes, I want to worship Jesus, but I want to worship him from my throne and my throne is built around my health, my comfort, my financial success, my view of how the world around me should function, like these different false gospels and I think it's God it is God's kindness that he exposes them he uses them and that's what happened to me as I'm preparing the sermon is just thing after thing some some false kingdoms that I could look back on and realize like yeah I know that was one that got eliminated through hard circumstances and then current ones where you're realizing okay why is why does this circumstance bother me so much it it's not because of the true gospel it's because you have you know, some other false kingdom that might look similar to Christ's kingdom, right? So if you look around in the culture and you feel like it's, you know, moving away from God's principles or, or whatever, like, yeah, I mean, that's something that we can grieve and we, and, but, but knowing that the, the gospel is not like any, any particular country's success, like that's not the kingdom that, and the gospel that, we're looking at to advance. And the point being, again, that if if that's your gospel, like if we're trying to advance a false gospel, then yeah, there's a lot of things that thwart it and we should be worried then. Like if your gospel is one of financial comfort, then the economy should worry you because that would that would stop the advance of your retirement account if the stock market just crashed, you know, and our economy collapsed. Yeah, and you really never come to a place of rest no, you know, whenever you're, whenever there's you're, no confidence, no, ever, because you know that, you should. It, because we know that things are volatile and that things change and that things are way outside of our control, and our kingdom. I mean, that's the, that's the problem with our kingdom. It's one of the problems is not only does our kingdom not look like God's kingdom, because in our kingdom it's my will be done on earth as in heaven, not His will, right? But our kingdoms are they're just not very strong. And they don't have, we don't have the ability to control all those factors that we believe will bring us whatever it is, contentment, joy, happiness. And, and I think, I mean, for me, I was just thinking, Jay, practically, one of the ways that I work through this daily is by praying through the Lord's Prayer. It's so interesting. When, the more I do it, the more I realize how supernatural and brilliant that prayer from Jesus was. Because it starts with, That very thing, that very idea of just your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. And when when we pray that, that's also a moment to say, but and not mine, and not my will, and not my kingdom, and help me to align my will with your will. And it's interesting to me how powerful just that daily reminder from Jesus and his words that he taught us to pray can be. Because I can right now during this podcast have a very clear mind about it. And an hour from now, I can forget that and think the good news today is that you just fill in the blank and you can just easily be distracted by something that isn't actually good news, but it feels like it is. So we just need to be reminded all the time. And I think I, what I have noticed that we struggle with is um, I think a lot of people believe that that once they turn to Jesus and they live a life that where they're that they're trying to follow Jesus, that that means they have pledged their allegiance to his kingdom and they no longer have 
these false kingdoms or these false idols. Like when we think of idolatry, I think we tend to think of people who aren't following Jesus. And Paul is writing to encourage Christians, people who are committed and to Christ, and he's reminding them, hey, the the advance of the gospel is not dependent on external circumstances. And I think, so I think we need to just be, I think just being aware, I think starting at a place where we just are aware that I have, I have false kingdoms, I have idolatry in my heart. It's there, whether I see it or I don't see it. It usually takes circumstances to bring those things out. And you just think about how God is, the, the, the more idols that get killed off of my heart, the freer I am. And the freer I am to worship Jesus and love him. And I am freer to worship Jesus than I was 20 years ago. I, by the grace of God, I think more and more idols have been killed off of my heart. More and more things that I would find my identity in have been killed off in my heart. More and more false gospels have been pushed out for the true gospel. But I pray that in another 20 years, I'd be able to say the same thing. Like I'd be able to say that, and I don't know what all those are, but I have to be mindful. And I think if, if that makes sense, I just, if I could wish for anything for our church family is to just realize that is a reality. I have them. It's not a question of do I have them or not. It's where are they? And and God doesn't want us fixated on that every day. Like our fixation should be on following Jesus. But as they come up in our hearts and as circumstances bring those things out, don't don't ignore that, right? Be open and aware. Oh, that's a, every bit as much as if you go in for a physical, if you're just convinced you are a pinnacle of health and perfect health, that it doesn't matter what the doctor says to you. It doesn't matter what the tests say. You're going to be convinced, well, that's, that's wrong or it's fine, or that's the way it's always been or whatever. That's your opinion. That's your opinion. (laughs) But if you go in because like, man, something I'm aware that I'm not in perfect health. I know I'm getting older. So the next time I go into the doctor, like I'm not going to be shocked when he goes like, Hey, you know, I I can't say I'm not going to be shocked, but I'm in theory, I don't expect like when you're 20 and you go to the doctor, you expect they're just like, you're doing great. Well, you're describing a posture of like, I'm open to that reality that I am not in perfect health. Right. And and I think in our spiritual lives, that's a really good point, Jay. I mean, this is ongoing for all of us. And as we walk through Philippians, it'll become even more clear from Paul's life that he didn't believe he had arrived yet either, that it's it's an ongoing process right. of change, of rooting these out. I, You know, as you were saying that too, I was just thinking, it's interesting the different ways that, that God gives us in the Bible of describing this thing. So you've been saying like false kingdom or counterfeit kingdom. So like kind of imagining a, a place or an environment or a circumstance that we believe will bring us what we really want. Another way of describing it is an idol, right? So like a false God that we are worshiping and loving and desiring. Um, The other one that was coming to my mind as you were saying that was false places of refuge. Like we're, we're people, we are looking for a place of safety and contentment and joy and we manufacture them in our mind. Like this is what that place will Mm. look like. This is what that circumstance will be but we never, we will never have that circumstance until we realize that God is our circumstance all the time. He is our circumstance. And to me, the process of growing in Christ's likeness is learning what that looks like. Cause I can say that, right? I can say God is my circumstance, but you mentioned this on Sunday too, feeling it all the way through who we are and more than just our, our head or intellect is the process of actually undergoing change. And that's, that's such good news that God does that in us. Um, but it is a lifelong thing. And it's something, like you said, that we are all in process of, of, of realizing that the places of safety, for example, of refuge, aren't actually places of safety. If they're not him, they're not. You mentioned on Sunday, too, identity. And I thought that was a really key idea in this as well, like building your identity on things that are not God, building your identity on something else. It's interesting, isn't it, how many different angles God gave us to think about this? It's really the same idea, but it's just different ways of conceiving of it. I love that. You're you're right. You're hundred percent right. Just as you're saying refuge and identity, I thought, yeah, I mean you and 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 I just quickly scribbled down just thinking this I'm thinking out loud here, but I'm thinking 
the kingdom, when we talk about false kingdoms, we're thinking about often what we want, like a, a way of life that we want to advance, you know, like a, a reign, a, you know, a ruling. Um, and so that often gets, that kind of often exposes our, um, a lot of times like political ideology or idolatry and that kind of thing. And then you have just like straight idolatry and you think about what do you worship? Like, what do you love? So like, what do you, what, what world do you want to see advance? What, what do you love? Refuge is like, yeah. Where do you find rest and security and, and safety? And you're right. Like we try to create our bubbles around us. Like that happens a lot when we as Christians want to separate and we want to pull out of the world to an extent. Like we're, tr- we're looking for a refuge. And rather than think about how often scripture talks about as God is our refuge. So David's refuge wasn't, wasn't the cave. His refuge was God, you know? And, and once he realizes that you like, you can be, you can be in any circumstance, you know, and be at, be at peace. Um, and then, you know, identity, like who are, what are you known as? And that's a, that's a huge one. You know, I touched on that with like, when, when our identities get threatened, then we start to question like, well, who are we? You know, who am I? And we see that in our culture and at all kinds of levels. And the incredible thing about the gospel is that God tells us who we are. Like our identity is actually really firm and it's secured by him, not by how we feel in any given moment. And all of those things are scary and painful to have the false versions removed. They, if you love something, if you idolize something, that means you love, like you are obsessed and you worship over it. To have that removed is painful. Like to have your place of refuge messed with is painful. I mean, I think of how, you know, I, I don't know why I was thinking about this. I was thinking about World War II and for how many children that grew up in Great Britain, you know, when the bombings are happening, everything like that, and what's happening in Ukraine and different places around the world, what is that like when your home is no longer safe? That you don't have, that it doesn't feel like a refuge. By the grace of God, I mean, a lot of us have have a refuge at home. We've talked about that before with kids on social media and, and trying to expose this is why social media is so dangerous for kids is because when you and I were going to school, if we got bullied at school, we could go home. We have a refuge. But now with social media, it it infiltrates the home. So now kids have fewer. They have the, the only refuge they have is to get rid of the thing that they're addicted to a lot of times. And so it's it's this it's a really dark place to be when when your refuge is taken away. But when kids. God is all of those things. Think about the flip and how secure you are. So when Christ's kingdom is the kingdom that you want to see advance, and Paul's saying, like, it's going to advance. Like, all these circumstances serve. So you, so the confidence that it's going to advance. When the only thing you worship is the true God, then that's never taken away from you, and you can't worship God too much. Like, you can't overvalue him um, when God is your refuge, then you can be at peace in every in every circumstance. And when your identity is in Christ, it is rock solid and not dependent on how you feel day to day, how you function day to day. So you think about how God delivers us from all those false versions and it can feel painful, but the result is just being basically bulletproof. And that's what we're going to see in Paul is, you know, he talks about to live as Christ, to die as gain. I count all things lost. Like he's communicating this idea that, that when you are able to, like when you let God do this work in you, that he will complete and he will bring you to, when you let him do this in you, you're going to like, you're going to be <laughs> full of joy and peace and so solid in, in where you stand and contentment and all these different things that are always fleeting in the when we do the world's versions of them it's really like it's yeah it's really fascinating sorry that was it is when it, and you sermon you, there. you paraphrased the the verse that was coming to my mind yep. was from the week earlier from it's verse six one six yeah. i'm sure of this that i am sure of this i wanted to say that would like underscore that he's he's confident of this that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of jesus christ and 
to me, that's our, that's our confidence right there is that he began the work in us. It wasn't our idea. It wasn't our idea to free us from those lesser forms of fulfillment, whatever, whatever you want to say those are basically sin and brokenness, but it was his idea to do that. And he is going to complete what he began and he desires it more than we do. That's where our confidence comes from because it's not dependent on is, is my willpower strong enough today to continue? Is my, is my focus great enough to continue to follow Christ? It, he, he continues his work in us and we can be confident of that. So when we come to the realization that, hey, here's a false refuge, a counterfeit kingdom, an idol, a, a false identity, we can do that. Yeah, it's going to, we're going to feel pain, but with new pain can come healing. And I think that's what he does in that. It's, it's not without cost. It, we do feel it. But that's a beautiful thing because he's bringing us to a new level of freedom in him and wholeness and holiness in him that he made us for. And the more that we experience that, I mean, to me, here, here's the thing. In the end, it's actually very simple, the way forward. It doesn't mean that it's simplistic, but it's simple. It's walking with Jesus. It's intimacy with Christ in our life. And as we walk with him, he, ta- he increasingly frees us from all of these things, whatever they are, to become more and more like him. Without intimacy with him, without a, a living connection with him, I don't see how we, we move forward in him. Um, but he, he continues to draw us into him, so we want that. And if we don't want it, we ask him, and he produces that in us, in our hearts. Yeah, and, I, and when we say that it's painful, I mean, it, it is. All growth is painful. I mean, you think about how God wired our bodies to reflect. So the physical world is created to point to his glory, and it, the physical world points to spiritual truths all the time. And one of them is that just the, think about the way our bodies are designed. It's painful to grow. So we literally have growing pains. It is it is wired into our DNA that that in order to grow there has to be pain. You see it in nature. You know, birds being pushed out of a nest. You know, to to fly. Like there's all these different things that happen. That um that if you want to gain muscle mass, you have to tear your muscles down in order to have them built back up. And and we don't like that. We wish that there was a uh, a less painful way to grow, but um, that's, that's the way. To, now in in heaven and glory, that'll be there won't be pain in in our growth because there will be no sin that hinders us. But like I think the important thing is to always remember that um, that God ha- does have a purpose in all of that, and that it's His love for us and His desire for us to experience life. And we have lots of parallels, but all of us can look at our lives and know, I mean, look at the way we think of the world. Like if, if you had a young person that said, um, well, I just, I want to, I want to be really successful, but it's, but I don't, I don't want to get up early in the morning and go to work. And you'd say, well, that's, what's wrong with kids these days is they don't, they don't know how to work. Like, well, yeah, what they're expressing is the same thing we all feel, which is, well, there's pain in that. And mm-hmm. we would all say like, yeah, but it's, it's worth it. You know, mm-hmm. most people don't enjoy feeling like really out of breath from exercise or sore, but people who do learn to enjoy it, they learn to enjoy it because they know what it produces. Mm-hmm. Like if muscle soreness, when muscle soreness happens because of like a medical condition, like arthritis, nobody likes that. I've never met anybody that's like, man, I feel a really good burn in my muscles because of this rheumatoid arthritis. Like, I don't know if that's burning muscles, but whatever the pain is, nobody enjoys that because it's destructive. And it's a reminder that's destructive. It's very different than if you go and you lift weights at the gym and you feel sore because you know that it's building in you. And that's the posture. If you look at pain, if we look at circumstances in our life and we see them as a sign of destruction that's why we panic that's why we have fear that's why we worry but if we see them as god doing something in us and working out our salvation in us and causing us to like building us in us a dependency on him that will lead us to more faith and more joy and more peace then that's when we can rejoice when we face trials of various kinds like we 
we gre- we can grieve in them every bit as much as when you're you know if you're working out and you know what it's producing that doesn't mean you don't still let out like a ah this like you you have to motivate yourself to keep going through it it's not it doesn't make it easy to do the workout knowing what it's going to produce in you but it's it's why you continue it's why you press on which is what Paul's going to also talk about pressing on it's why the author of Hebrews says Jesus pressed on that we press on, like looking to Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising its shame. Like that's that's the picture that is put out there in front of us. But again, it all starts with being aware um, that my heart is going to constantly be producing idols and false refuges and false um, kingdoms. If I don't, then what I will do is I will conflate my kingdom with God's kingdom. I'll conflate my idols with God and I'll try to mix them so that I can preserve them both. And that doesn't, that doesn't work. No. And, and especially because our idols, they, they don't reflect God's character, right? They're always characters of him mm. and they promise relief. They promise safety. They promise wholeness or whatever it is that we're looking for. But they can't deliver it because they're they're they don't exist actually right they're false and they have no power and our god is so much better i mean he's gracious and he's loving and overflowing with love for us constantly which is why he frees us from the it's why he won't tolerate them in our lives because he knows they don't bring about life they promise something they can't deliver and that's why i think that's part of the pain we experience is to realize this thing is actually powerless Mm-hmm. This thing that I have banked on cannot deliver me. And, you know, we don't ever do that that explicitly, right? That's something that God's spirit reveals. Like, wow, I've been really banking on this thing. I've been really depending on this thing that it will never it will never deliver me from what I need deliverance from. Yeah, and I think what we tend to do then is we end up when that kind of false idol that or that idol or that false kingdom pops up in our hearts, there can be a tendency to, if we're not aware that we have them, if we just assume that like whatever we desire, like, well, I'm a Christian. So whatever I desire, that's God's desire, you know, and we just don't have a, we don't have a frame of reference, um, to say, ah, man, this is exposing something in me. If we don't do that, then, like I said, we, we conflate them. We, we make, we find reasons why the idol I'm pursuing is actually honoring to God. Why the false gospel I'm preaching is actually honoring. It's, it's, it's actually serves the the true gospel. And then we'll find, and often the way we do it, especially in the evangelical church is we find scripture to back up the support of our idol. And so, you know, take something like money where we can say, okay, if, you know, I understand generosity and I understand, like, we can say all that, but then if I start stressing about, you know, wanting to save for retirement and stressing about the economy and, and we can say like, well, because, you know, because I want to be generous. Like, so, so I, I might be getting exposed for having a false, an idol in my, my, finding my comfort and security and joy in having resources and having enough for a comfortable retirement, for example, And when I worry about that, rather than letting it expose that false idol, I can say, well, no, that's just because I want to take care of people and I want to be able to be generous. And so when, you know, when I have a lot, I can be generous. And it's, you know, the Bible says that we're supposed to be good stewards. And the Bible talks about these principles of dealing with, and you start quoting that. And pretty soon you're, you're not only conflating God's kingdom with this little kingdom and refuge that you have, which is your retirement account, but you're now using the Bible to defend that false kingdom and that false refuge. And, and then it goes all the way to like, then we see churches go into prosperity gospel because I don't want to be poor, right? Like I don't want to be. And and then we start you, you, and we know that we hear these things of like, Oh, um, I mean, that's a common thing with prosperity gospel to talk about, like we're kids of the King. And so we don't live like paupers, you know, we live like, like royalty, and so just a perversion of scripture and a perversion of what's being said, but all it's doing is just serving like my, my desire to hang on to my false refuge, uh, my false idol, my false identity. 
and and then using the Bible. So that, like that is it gets messy and it gets complex, you know, when you start then hearing people quote scripture and it seems like, okay, well, yeah, I mean, that is what the Bible says. And so, but be mindful of what's the gospel that's actually being advanced there. Um, and again, you can apply that to, to family, like idolizing family and saying like, okay, well, I'm supposed to, I demand obedience from my kids because like they're supposed to be obedient to the Lord and they're supposed to be obedient they have to learn that and I have to, so then I'm going to control that or force that rather than shepherding their hearts. And then I'm going to be able to quote verses that, you know, spare the rod, spoil the child. And I'm going to be able to just throw these things out there to, to build around this identity and this kingdom that like, no, my kids are going to behave and they're going to be what I want them to be. See it in the political arena for sure. And we can quote all kinds of verses but it's all exposing it's 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 all in defense of a false kingdom and a false gospel and we have to go back to that root of just being aware that i have these and and i think one of the ways you can do it is is to ask the question of like well what if what if my fear is realized i found that to be really helpful in my life practically like to just dial it back cuz i know i get big picture and philosophical and then it's like people don't know they're just they get lost cuz they're they're gardening right now or going for a bike ride <laughs> and, and a, too much, too much philosophy for that. But I'll ask myself when I feel that come up in me of stress about a situation, worry, anxiety, whatever, I'll often ask like, what if, mm-hmm. what if that fear is realized? What if, what if that test is this? What if that, what if, what if we do lose everything on this, you know, investment? What if, we do lose this election. You know, the person that I was supporting loses the election. What if, and what that'll do often is that kind of exposes it. Like, do I, do I believe that the gospel will stop? Do I believe that God is going to sit there and go, Oh no, I did not see that coming. And you know, if you're following Jesus, it'll pretty quickly, you'll realize like, no, that isn't the case at all. And so that gives you a sense of security and exposes. And on the flip side, if you find yourself saying, what if, and you say, I don't want to live in that world, or I don't think I could handle that. That's when you really know there's a false idol in a kingdom. Does that make sense? Like anytime you say, I couldn't, I could not live without this thing, this person, this place, this whatever. Anytime you do something like that, now you're really crossing over into where you say, okay, this is, this is the idol, you know, I think Tim Keller, C.S. Lewis, like they both have talked about that idea that whatever you can't live without Piper, I know has talked about that, like whatever you can't live without, that's, that's your idol. And you can get there by asking the question whenever any worry comes up, just saying like, okay, what if, what if my worst fear about this comes true? Then what? Yeah. And that's, that's where we feel that pain because all of a sudden that's not, it's not doing what I hoped it would do. And, you know, it's interesting. One of the things that we learn from Jesus as we follow him as disciples, he, he fills in the blank. So just like finish this sentence. It means to be well off. Like, this is what it means to be well off as a human being. And you know, dot, dot, dot. And you fill in the blanks or what does it mean to be well off? He answers that question. And when, and it's always God. It's always his kingdom, being part of his kingdom and what he's doing, knowing him. That is always the answer he gives. When we answer that question, what does it mean to be well off? By saying, lots of money. And then we, then that we're, we've already gone wrong, okay? But then if we start using the Bible, like you were saying, to, to back that up, it's even worse, right? Then we're, we're, we're already living for something that isn't going to bring us what Jesus says we need. And it's not to say that those things can't be, you know, useful tools in our life. That's what we we are stewards of what he gives us, but it's when we, we live with the, the constant threat or, um, the, the insecurity that those things aren't stable because they never are that we're missing out. We're missing out on the joy that we could have in him. If we would learn from Jesus, this is what it means to be well off, to know me. That, that's what the whole point of our day is today, is to know him and to walk with him. No matter what our, our day holds for us, that is the point of it. 
And those things that we experience along the way are his means of drawing us into deeper union with him and, and our mission in the world. And I think, yeah, when you say that, I just think how important it is to, it is important to practice gratitude and giving, like what Paul says, and giving thanks in all circumstances. Um, just being in that process of, um, so when I think about that, I often, you know, I try to give thanks to God in all circumstances. And when they are joyful circumstances, overtly, you know, and, and externally joyful circumstances, you know, a, a beautiful day and you go on a bike ride or, um, you know, hanging out with, family or friends and those gifts like thanking God for those gifts is really it's really important because he he's the giver of all good gifts it's not like it's not like his call for us is hey I want you to be miserable the reality is is that most of our lives um are actually just it's God's kindness and his blessings that we get to enjoy the world around us it's but we are also being prepared, you know, in, in the trials. And even when we are in the midst of really hard seasons, there's still like incredible blessings all around us, you know, all the time. But, but we are also giving thanks. Like, I don't know when I, when I've been through hard seasons and I'm giving thanks, I'm often giving thanks that these are not, that, that these circumstances don't have the final say on me. Right. Like I, I'm thankful. I'm thankful that this is not what eternity looks like. I'm thankful. Um, I, I'm thankful that God is, is not a victim of these circumstances. Like there's so much stuff to, to, there's so many opportunities to praise God and to give thanks to him. And that's what Paul is doing. And when we get to that place, like that's where it really is. We're able, we're able to, um, rejoice in all circumstances we're able to be content in all circumstances we're able to have joy and peace that last and persevere and that's what we want that's the that the great irony of all this is the idols that we worship the kingdoms we live for it's not the actual thing it's what they promise to deliver right so nobody nobody gets really excited at seeing a big number in their retirement account like in and of itself that means nothing because if you have a big number in your retirement account and tomorrow the dollar loses all its value, well, then it doesn't matter that you have a big, no one's going to be happy that they have a big number. They're going to see it as useless. Why? Because it's what it represents. It, it represents a value that represents a way of life that represents some form of refuge, security, safety, joy, all these different things. That's what we actually all are chasing. And what Paul is saying to them over and over again in this letter, certainly here is all those things are actually found in Christ. And when you find them in Christ, it can't be taken away from you. You can't, you can't lose it. It can't be threatened. If you're living for his kingdom, it's going to advance. If you're worshiping him, you won't be put to shame. If you are finding refuge in him, you'll always be at peace and at rest and if your identity is in him it'll never it'll never be shaken who wouldn't who wouldn't want that it's the best news in the world it is the best <laughs> news in the world it really is and that's why we're that's why we preach it right so um and we get by the way as we kind of wrap up here um we understand i just i think it bears repeating that we are not at all saying like well, hey, buck up, you know, if you, if you're in painful circumstances, um, because what can happen then too, is you can start to feel shame that you're not over, outwardly rejoicing when you're in painful circumstances and start questioning yourself of like, well, does this mean I don't trust Jesus? Does this mean I don't have faith? And I would just, again, remind people, I didn't talk about it on Sunday, but we've talked about it before that picture Jesus, you know, when we preached in the I am series and I am the resurrection and the life and the response of Jesus to Mary and Martha when Lazarus, their brother had died, that Jesus weeps like that. He weeps with them. It's not a fake cry. It's not a patronizing cry. It's not a fearful cry. It's a grief stricken cry. Jesus is grieving with them, even though he knows full well what he's going to do. 
He knows full well that the pain that they are experiencing is temporary. He knows full well that it's actually going to end up, those circumstances are going to serve to increase their faith infinitely. He knows all those things. And yet he still weeps with them. And I just think that's such an incredible picture of remembering that it's not sinful. It is not lacking faith to grieve or to mourn any, any more than when you're working out. It's, it's like counterproductive to feel pain or to think, oh, I don't like that. I'm feeling this way. This is hard. Our hope is not in that. It's, it's in just trusting the confidence. Like Paul said, I have this confidence. I'm sure he's going to complete the work. I'm sure this is going to advance the gospel. I am sure that I'm going to persevere and I am sure that I'm not going to be put to shame in the end. And that's, that's the confidence that we all want to have. And we want to help you have, we want to encourage you in that. Amen to that. You looked like you had something profound to say. That's why I paused there. No, I'm just, it's, you always, I'm, I'm feeling thankful at the moment that I got to start my Tuesday thinking about these things with you. <laughs> it's right? an important conversation and it's, these are, these are not just, um, ideas. It's, we're, we're actually describing reality the way that God has revealed it. And it's a, it's an amazing way to start a day. I'm just feeling thankful. Well, I hope that whoever's listening to this is feeling thankful also. Me too. And, you know, reach out and let us know. This is why, again, why we trumpet this all the time, why we need each other. You need to be in community because it's in community. There are times where I don't see, I don't see how the gospel is advancing. I don't see, um, you know, like how I can be giving thanks. And my brothers and sisters that are around me in the moment can point me back to Jesus and can sometimes just sit with me and grieve with me. They don't need to have any answers, but, um, but sometimes, sometimes we do need to process it and talk, you know, talk through it and we need people to be praying for us. So it's good to reach out to a brother or sister and say, Hey, could you pray that I would worship God right now? And that I would give thanks to him because right now I'm really struggling to, to have peace and to have joy And it's not content answers all the time. Like we think that it's about like, well, if we just have more knowledge, like that doesn't, Mm -mm. you can know full well that God is in control and know full well the gospel is going to advance and still be battling in your heart, the rejoicing in that. And so it's a great thing to reach out to somebody and just say, hey, would you pray that for me? And um, we would love to, to help in that and help facilitate that. So you can, as always, reach out at connect at faithpeshtigo.com or give us a call or talk to us on a Sunday morning. We appreciate you taking the time to listen. Hopefully it has been helpful. Until next time, grace and peace. Peace.